Hey there everybody. I hope that this video finds you all well. This tutorial is going to follow along with my latest painting, Holy Diver. Some of it will match up with what you're seeing uh, that I'm doing and sometimes I will pause the time lapse in order to illustrate a point, but some of it I will be just talking over the time lapse of the painting um, about various subjects. Which subjects, you inquire? Well, so kind of you to ask. Composition, especially dynamic composition, but also focusing on the way that different types of composition can help set the mood for a painting. Perspective, especially the importance, uh, in this case, of a secondary figure to show scale. And story. It's gonna be a little bit longer than some of my other tutorials because I have a little bit more to talk about with this one. All the things I touch on here today are written originally by artists much greater than myself. Uh, just as a reminder, I'm going through and doing studies and tutorials out of books and such to learn to be a better artist, and I am taking you, dear viewer, on that journey with me. So to begin with, where pretty much every artwork should start, yes, even portraits, and maybe still lifes, story. The first thing you should always do is choose your story, even if it's a small story or a hint of a story. I wasn't clear on my full story in this when I first began thumbnailing. It wasn't until the end of the thumbnail process that I stumbled upon it with the help of my husband, which I will tell you more about in a bit. So sometimes coming up with thumbnails will help you to figure out your story, like it did with me. Um, I was originally inspired by a quote by Douglas Adams, Silent Thunders of the Deep. Uh, it's just part of a longer quote, but it was such a cool phrase that it got my imagination running. I wanted to paint a sea monster. So I set up several blocks on a page like this to start my thumbnailing process, and I just start painting. I've talked about the importance of thumbnails in another video. See my video on uh, my painting lingering for that. So I won't do much to explain the purpose of them here, but you can see how important they were for me in this. It starts out as a really lame looking, uninteresting creature that is all on one plane. The curves are just going from left to right only. And then I started thinking about dynamic composition and the importance of lines and curves to lead the viewer's eye through a painting. So I added a third dimension so that the beast was not only going from left to right, but also toward the camera a bit not to mention winding around in the background. So you see that those curves and shapes are just slowly becoming more interesting as I go through the thumbnail process. Then I try out different things in front of the creature. Um, sharks fleeing or a di diver are my two main ideas. I knew I wanted something there though. Why? To show the size of the creature. Without a frame of reference, a second figure, specifically something that we know the size of, like a person or sharks. Without that second figure, we don't have any idea how big this dude is. So then I start focusing a bit on composition. I didn't want the creature's mouth and the diver, which is this focus, to be in the center of the frame, either vertically or horizontally. Um, that's a good rule of thumb for most paintings, by the way, unless you're doing it purposefully or it's a portrait or some such, which again, I'll go into in a minute. Um, ultimately, I didn't go 100% with any of these thumbnails, but it's closest to the second to last. I moved the diver so that there was a bit of overlap with the diver in the mouth so that her peril seemed even more dire. The monster was just about to eat her. Incidentally, the idea for this, as I mentioned previously, came at the end of the thumbnail process. My husband walked by and saw these thumbnails, the one with the diver in it specifically, and started singing Holy Diver by Dio. Um, <laughs> I was gonna sing it for you, but I'm not. Okay, so my brain immediately seized upon that and decided to have the diver performing some sort of underwater exorcism. So sometimes it's just a random event like this one that helps your story to be born. But be sure that you do have a story, even if it's just a small one or a hint of one. So back to dynamic composition. First off, what really is dynamic composition? Um, basically it's chaos. Think of a perfectly centered portrait or a tree centered in a field or a sunset with the sun in the center. These are all very tranquil, 
calming compositions, and they're meant to be. You can communicate a lot via your composition itself. A balanced composition like that with something centered communicates peace and tranquility. Use it when you're trying to achieve these kinds of feelings for a peaceful feeling and see how well it can work for you. It does wonders. If, on the other hand, you're trying to create a feeling of excitement or movement or energy or drama, then you're going to want to use lots of lines of varying directions, horizontal, vertical, diagonal, and curves. It creates a chaotic or unsettling or exciting feeling and forces the eye to travel up, down, across, and from front to back in the plane of the canvas. It creates tension and interest. Variation can also create dynamicism. That is a hard word to say. Irregularity is visual eye candy. Um, the human eye seems to love irregularity and randomness and odd groups of objects rather than even ones, strangely enough. So like three geese flying in a group is better than four or two. Okay, back to dynamic composition. Um, it's what I was going for here, obviously, since I was painting a sea monster. I wanted to communicate that danger, that excitement, all of those things. Um, a balanced composition would not have been the answer in this case, so I went for an off-center focus, lots of curves, and my sea monster traveling through the X, Y, and Z axis, axes. Um, that's a good start toward making this composition dynamic. So here's another interesting tidbit that I used on this one. Since most of us read from left to right, things that are going from left to right in the frame of the canvas are perceived by us as being faster moving than something going from right to left. Kind of cool, right? Another handy trick, and I'm gonna flip away from my time lapse of the painting at this point to show you. Uh, to illustrate what I'm talking about. One of the simplest ways to make your composition more dynamic is by rotating the camera, if you will, so that your horizon line isn't straight left to right. I didn't have a horizon line here, being underwater and weightless, but if I did, it definitely would have been tilted. Check out this speed painting I did last year. It was done in only an hour, so it's not horribly detailed, but I think it'll illustrate my point nicely. So I'm showing you the original version on the left with the horizon line tilted. When I straighten out that horizon line and make the girl straight up and down as a result, it changes the feel of the painting. Now look again when I center the girl and change even the comets streaking through the air so that they're going straight down. It changes the feel of it even further. It's not necessarily a bad thing. It just becomes more tranquil and less dynamic. And with fiery comets streaking through the air, you probably want dynamic. So I'm putting the original version back up now to show you all the different movement lines uh, so you can see what I, what I mean when I talk about many diagonal lines in varying directions. There's the horizon line, that's one. The girl, that's another, almost 90 degrees to the horizon line. The direction most comets are generally moving, which is a third. And lastly, even though you can barely see it, the Milky Way is there in the background, going at almost a 90 degree angle to the comets. So all this disarray creates that feeling of excitement and dynamicism. All right, I'm gonna put the time-lapse of Holy Diver back up now so you can continue to watch while I talk. Um, when it comes to viewer engagement, something that can be helpful is the power of suggestion. Letting the viewer's mind fill in the blanks keeps them engaged and innately makes them more interested than they would have been otherwise. Just be careful not to overdo it. Suggestion can be done in terms of something like darkness, just showing a suggestion of what's coming out of the darkness and the viewer's mind and imagination will automatically create an idea of that creature or whatever in their minds. For me, in this one, it's the creature coming out of the murky depths of the water. So you can see it fading off into the distance, uh, its curls, the curls of its body. 
as it goes back further, if you look really closely, which some people may or may not see. Um, your mind sees it though, and it's filling in the blanks for what this creature looks like. Even though I only made a hint of the illness that continues, you just fill in the blanks. So um, another thing that can work really well with suggestion is like a really powerful character expression that can make the viewer try to fill in the story behind what's happening in their mind. So it doesn't have to be visually um, just a suggestion. It can be um, emotionally, an emotional suggestion too. So you can also have um, part of the character or subject leaving the frame. This suggests that there's more going on outside the viewer's field of vision. So you have a leg or an arm or even just the top of a head or something just barely off the frame. That makes the viewer think that there's more to the story than they're seeing and their mind might fill in those things with story or what might be possibly happening behind them or around the figure. Probably the very most common trick used to create a dynamic feeling of movement is to add elements moving through the frame, like particles, wind, dust, leaves, petals, etc. In this case, I have bubbles that are blurred as if the creature is moving quickly. Another thing I want to touch on here, since it relates to this painting and to story, is the importance of an exaggerated pose at least sometimes, in dynamic compositions, specifically. Probably not best for things like portraits, but comic artists use exaggeration all the time. As you can see here, um, I used it a bit in my diver. I tried to make her pose as if she was flailing around and swimming backward, trying to get out of the way of the leviathan, dragon, creature, sea monster thing. I'm gonna put a close-up of the diver here for you to see what I'm talking about. Um, her arms are out to her sides as if she's off balance. <laughs> Not that there's really balance underwater, but the idea behind the concept still holds true. Uh, there are bubbles all around her, not too many, as I didn't want to obscure her at all, to help create that sense of movement, hopefully. She's kicking. Her hair is being pushed forward around her face as she moves backward. All of these things are exaggerated attempts to show that sense of movement where she's trying to get away from the creature. I could do a whole tutorial on exaggerated pose, and probably will. There's a lot to cover, really, and I'm not all that familiar with it myself yet. I do a lot of portraits, so I'm still learning all this stuff about dynamic composition and exaggerated poses along with you guys. So. We will take that journey together in another tutorial with another painting on another day. So back to Holy Diver and the time lapse of it. And I have another thing to point out. Notice that the blues of the ocean are slightly bluer and lighter in the area behind the head of the creature and behind the diver. This creates more contrast between that background and the darks and glowing oranges of the creature. These areas of highest contrast will become a natural focal point in your paintings. So in short, if there's something that you wanna make a focal point of your paintings, use contrast in color or light to bring attention to it. The highest and lowest values are deliberately placed in my creature's head here to draw a strong focus to this area. Also, if you have a face with strong lighting, where one side is much more light than the other, try putting a darker background behind the lit side of the face and a lighter background behind the dark side of the face and see how much more it makes that head pop. It doesn't have to be dramatically lighter or darker, just a bit, and you will see the difference. And that will also draw the eye, obviously, is what I'm trying to say. Uh, detail is another way to draw the eye. This is something I could stand some more practice with because I tend to like to put detail everywhere, but I think I achieved it this time. The most detail is around the focal point um, as well, the creature's head and <laughs> our poor diver. The rest of the creature has only suggestions of ridges and shapes. 
Just a few more things about story, which doesn't really apply to this painting, so I'll just talk about it while I paint. This is a pretty simple story. Demon monster thing tries to eat some sort of specialized diver that seems to be trying to perform some sort of exorcism, hence the glowing cross. But what about something huge and epic like a war scene? There's a lot you could paint with a war scene. They are huge. Think about those scenes full of armies, almost like tidal waves pouring toward each other from across the screen on some of those epic fantasy and sci-fi movies. You could paint that, but it would lack a personal touch. Movies have the luxury of that because they have multiple scenes. They switch back and forth between that epicness and their characters, so you get an idea for the sheer size of the force while also focusing on our heroes. Now, mind you, if that sheer size of the force is the point of the image, then that drawn back, far away painting of those tides coming towards each other is exactly what you want to paint. But in most cases, the person commissioning you or you or whoever is going to want to focus on a central main character, some sort of hero or villain. As an illustrator, we oftentimes only have one image to tell our story in. So how do you choose what to paint? First, ask yourself what elements have to be in the scene. The less you can show, things that are fundamental to the story that you're drawing or painting, the more personal it's going to be. But you can still hint at that epicness. So things that must be in the scene. Is there a hero that is central to the story? He has to be in there. What should be in the image comes next. Preferably in this case, a villain or obstacle or something that's creating the drama for this hero. Also secondary characters or enough characters to suggest the epic battle raging around our hero. Lastly, what kind of things are optional but would be nice to have in there? Um, these are smaller elements that can be personal touches that help to tell the story, things that are specific to this story and interesting. Do not try to show all the stories and problems and elements of the battle or scene into one image. You will fail. It will become cluttered and will take focus from your main character. If you are lucky enough to have more than one image that you can use to tell the story, do them there. Otherwise, save them for your own head or another day. I mentioned that we want chaos for dynamic composition, but not too much chaos. There's a balance somewhere. Just to be clear, the chaos that I talked about earlier comes into the composition when you're creating it, not when you're choosing what you want to paint. Uh, you still want one or a few central characters or objects central to the theme and story of your image, and that's it. The less stuff you can put in there and still tell the story, the better. The stronger an impact the illustration will make in most cases. If you make it clear what is going on while zoomed way out or in a thumbnail, bravissima! The clearer you make it, and the faster you make it clear what's happening, the more chance you have of getting noticed. And getting noticed is important, as any beginning artist can attest. In short, keep it simple. Okay, I think that's about all I wanted to cover this time around. Uh, these longer tutorials, by the way, will be few and far between, at least on YouTube. I am thinking seriously about starting up a Patreon or Gumroad account where I can provide much longer, more in-depth tutorials for just a few bucks. Uh, this little bit of monetary assistance would help give me the time to be able to produce more of them. So if you have any interest in that, let me know in the comments. I know there's plenty of people out there making tutorials, so I guess we'll just see. I wouldn't want to start it up, though, if nobody's interested. Um, it does take a decent amount of time to make these, but I feel like this is like the absolutely perfect opportunity and time for me to do it. It makes total sense to me to make tutorials that follow along as I do these studies and while I learn more about all this stuff myself. So if I can do more of it with your support, all the better, yes? However. I do not want you guys to worry that I'm going to stop putting these up on YouTube. I'm going to continue. I have no intention of stopping that for as long as I am learning and doing my studies. If I can do the longer tutorials, then what I would do is a shorter version of it for YouTube. 
then if you yearn for more info about that particular subject, you can pay just a little bit and get the longer version. Okay, um, that is it for now. I hope that you enjoyed Holy Diver and this tutorial. Feel free to leave comments and also to subscribe if you want to see more. Thanks.